December 4th, 1943. Edward R. Murrow is the voice that brings the war in Europe home to millions of Americans listening to CBS radio. He ends his empathetic but fact-driven reporting with good night and good luck. And one night this week, he most certainly needs that luck himself when he boards an RAF Lancaster to fly over Germany through flak and nighttime fighter attacks to bomb Berlin. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. Last week, the members of the Imperial Japanese Navy massacred the British and Australian POW trying to escape the sinking hellship Suez Maro. 548 went into a watery grave. In Italy, the arrest of Jewish Italians for deportation to enslavement and murder began. More information about the atrocities at Auschwitz reached British intelligence. The RAF raided Berlin three times, causing widespread destruction and several thousand deaths. On December 2nd, they return with 458 aircraft. Four journalists are on board as many planes. They are U.S. reporter Edward R. Murrow for CBS, Norwegian author Nordal Grieg for the Norwegian State Radio in Exile, Australian Norman Stockton for the Sydney Sun, and American Lowell Bennett for the International News Service. Forty planes are shot down, among them three of the planes carrying journalists. Grieg and Stockton are killed, while Bennett survives and is captured by the Germans on the ground. Murrow makes it back, and the next day his report of the raid is broadcast on CBS. The 18-minute report is a vivid description of the fear and bravery of the crew of the Lancaster, D-Dog, that he is aboard. He tells of his own gut-wrenching fear when the plane buckles, swerves, and twists, throwing him around into his knees as a young pilot evades the searchlights, anti-aircraft grenades, and intercepting night fighters. As they drop their big bomb and several clusters of incendiary bombs setting Berlin aflame, he wonders at the destruction. Berlin was a kind of orchestrated hell, a terrible symphony of light and flame. It isn't a pleasant kind of warfare. The men doing it think of it as a job. Yesterday afternoon, when the tanks were stretched out on the big map, all the way to Berlin and back again, a young pilot with old eyes said to me, I see we're working again tonight. That's the frame of mind in which the job is being done. The job isn't pleasant. It's terribly tiring. Men die in the sky while others are roasted alive in their cellars. Berlin last night wasn't a pretty sight. In about 35 minutes, it was hit with about three times the amount of stuff that ever came down on London in a night-long blitz. This is a calculated, remorseless campaign of destruction. Right now, the mechanics are probably working on D-Dog, getting him ready to fly again. The next night, although D-Dog does not fly this time, other RAF planes bring that destruction to nearby Leipzig when 527 bombers raid that nearby city. Much of the fire brigades have been pulled out to Berlin, where they have managed to stop a firestorm from erupting. Their absence spells doom for the Leipzig Old City Center as a firestorm raises it to the ground. It is the end of Leipzig as the capital of German book publishing, when the major publishing houses burn together with 50 million books, including countless original historical and modern manuscripts. With the fire brigades away, many of the inhabitants defy the orders to stay in their shelters until all clear and come out to fight the fires. They help contain the firestorm, and it contributes to a relatively low death rate. When they avoid the suffocation inside oxygen-deprived, carbon monoxide-filled shelters that we have seen kill so many in previous firestorms. And yet, 1,812 men, women, and children die, and another 60 declared missing will never be accounted for. Just as the RAF plan foresees, it does not affect wartime production. Much further south, in the port city of Bari, it is Italian civilians who suffocate from mustard gas when the German Luftwaffe hit a U.S. transport ship loaded with a huge shipment of gas grenades. Indy will tell more about this and explain why the Americans are sending mustard gas to Italy in his episode for this week. 
And he also tells you of the Tehran Conference, where British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt, and Soviet de facto dictator Joseph Stalin decide that post-war Poland's future borders will shift without giving the Poles themselves a say in the matter. Stalin will also be allowed to take control over the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Furthermore, further steps are taken to create a peacetime version of the United Nations Alliance to promote international peace and security, in which the four major powers, the UK, US, Soviet Union, and China, will be the four policemen. The evening before the final declaration is made, the three leaders meet for dinner. It begins on very cordial terms. King George VI has sent Churchill with a gift for Stalin, a ceremonial sword made of Sheffield steel commemorating the victory at Stalingrad, a sword he kisses as he receives it. As the dinner begins, the Soviet premier declares that, without American machines, the United Nations never could have won the war. But then things turn sour when Stalin proposes that after the war they should summarily execute some 50 to 100,000 random German officers, guilty of war crimes or not, to deter future militarism in Germany. Roosevelt thinks it's a joke and quips back, maybe 49,000 would be enough. Churchill doesn't think it's funny, protests the idea of a cold-blooded execution of soldiers who fought for their country, and storms out of the room. While Stalin goes after him, claims he was indeed joking, and gets Churchill to return to the table, there is some evidence that Stalin is indeed sounding the waters for the other leader's appetite for mass murder. There is one area that Stalin and Churchill see eye to eye on, though how to handle Josip Broz Tito's partisan forces in Yugoslavia. Last week, Winston Churchill said that it was a lamentable fact that virtually no supplies had been conveyed by sea to the 222,000 followers of Tito. These stalwarts were holding as many Germans in Yugoslavia as the combined Anglo-American forces were holding in Italy south of Rome. The Germans had been thrown into some confusion after the collapse of Italy and the Patriots had gained control of large stretches of the coast. We had not, however, seized the opportunity. But the Germans had recovered and were driving the partisans out bit by bit. The main reason for this was the artificial line of responsibility which ran through the Balkans. Considering that the partisans had given us such a generous measure of assistance at almost no cost to ourselves, it was of high importance to ensure that their resistance was maintained and not allowed to flag. With that assistance, and by their own force, the partisans have steadily increased their position after the Italian collapse, greatly increasing the number of fighters and sustaining efficient supply lines. Against the backdrop of these developments, the three big resolved that the Yugoslav partisans are now a legitimate allied liberation force. That means more material and operational support, and gives the partisans legitimacy as the official organization representing Yugoslavia further sidelining their rivals, the Chetniks. On November 29th, in the Bosnian village of Jajce, the Anti-Fascist Council of National Liberation of Yugoslavia meets for the second time since they formed in 1941. The council unites the various ethnic, ideological, and regional liberation committees under one banner, although the military power that collects the Tito is by far the dominant force. The council appoints an interim government and recognizes Yugoslavia as a federal state. A public referendum shall decide if King Peter will be allowed to return after the war. Both are a direct challenge to the Yugoslav government in exile represented by the king as head of state. The rift is deepened when Tito proclaims his own provisional democratic Yugoslav government in exile as the week ends. Meanwhile, Tito's forces are assembling around Rogatica and Vlasenica in the southern part of East Bosnia to make an advance into Serbia. On December 2nd, the Germans strike preemptively in Operation Kugelblitz, Operation Thunderbolt. The operation is led by the 5th SS Mountain Corps at the head of a coalition of mainly German forces with some Bulgarian, Croat, and local Chetnik additions. The details of what happens are murky, but in the last two days of this week, the partisan units are already taking heavy casualties, falling back or even dispersing. The roughly 70,000 strong German-led coalition aims to encircle the partisan troops in western Croatia, and this time they aim to stop them from one of their previous last-minute escapes and destroy them. 
across the Adriatic Sea in Italy, the Germans are leading a different coalition of destruction. Together with their Salo Republic helpers, they now take another step in the genocide of Jewish Italians and foreign Jewish refugees in Italy. After the fascist regime collapsed and before the German occupation began, the Italian semi-open concentration camps mostly closed with anyone held in them released. But on November 30, 1943, Italian Salo Republic Minister of the Interior, Guido Bafarini Guidi, issues Police Order No. 5. All Jews, even those who have been exonerated, whatever their nationality, who are residents within the national territory, shall be interned in special concentration camps. Their personal possessions and real estate shall be impounded and then confiscated in the interest of the Italian Social Republic, which will distribute it for the benefit of the homeless, who were made so by enemy air raids. In the meantime, the Jews shall be interned in provincial camps to await transfer to specially designated concentration camps. The days after the order is given, hundreds of arrest warrants are issued by provincial police leaders. The police chief of Venice, Filippo Cordova, warns Jews not to leave their place of residence and to report to the Carabinieri and orders most influential and dangerous Jews are to be placed under guard in their homes. At the end of the week, the Venice police is standing by, ready to strike when the order comes. The reinterment operation is not the only Italian story of this war that comes back to haunt humanity this week. The Italian War of Aggression against Greece in 1940-41 left around 15,000 Greek veterans disabled. Under the German occupation, many of them were dependent on the care from 19 hospitals in Athens. Despite their disabilities that range from lost limbs to partial or complete paralysis to blindness, they themselves formed the Coordinating Committee of the Invalid Struggle in an effort to raise funds to feed themselves and get access to better medical care. Now, in 1943, the committee has grown into a beacon to rally unarmed resistance, organizing demonstrations against the occupation and forced labor conscription. A lot of disabled veterans have even actively participated in the demonstrations to the best of their abilities, with the dozens paying with their lives for doing so. The Italian surrender has emboldened the committee, and their hospitals are now distribution centers for arms and supplies for the Iam Ela's resistance movement. On November 26, the leading members of the committee are arrested and shot by a Greek collaborationist execution squad. Some of the disabled committee leaders can't stand or even sit without aid, so they are tied to chairs to be executed. On November 30th, some 1,000 men of a German-led security battalion blockade the Athenian hospitals. And location after location, at the blow of a whistle, they storm the buildings, shoot and bayoneting anyone in their way. Some victims are beaten with their own prosthetic limbs. Close to 4,000 disabled veterans are dragged through the hospitals and out to trucks waiting to take them away. About 500 are taken to different concentration camps in Germany. The most severely wounded are taken to heavily guarded prison hospitals, and 3,000 go to the recently opened Khaidari concentration camp. Here they come under the regime of Camp Commandant Paul Radomski. He is an old fighter of the Nazi party who began his career in the SS in the early 1930s together with the architect of the Holocaust, the late Reinhard Heydrich. When the German occupation of Ukraine began, he was put in charge of the Siretz concentration camp near Kiev. Here, he made a name for himself as such an unusually brutal commandant that even other SS men shunned him. After the liberation of Kiev earlier this month, he was ordered to Athens to open up the Haidari camp. Under his reign, in the next 10 days, 283 more veterans will be executed, while the rest are put on starvation rations and forced to do hard labor despite their disabilities. In this world of suffering and hatred, it is hard to see a light. One young woman who has sought and found a glimmer of hope in this darkness is murdered in Auschwitz this week. She is 27-year-old Eti Hillesum. As this war began, she was a troubled young Dutch woman of a secular Jewish family with ambitions to perhaps one day become an author. Her troubles were those of most people in their early and mid-twenties. The complications of love and sexuality, her future path, her identity as an adult woman, and the limitations she faced to realize her dreams. An avid reader and intellectual by nature, she also had deeper inner demons. 
the egocentrism of youth clashing with the expectation of empathy for others, a lack of faith driving the gnawing questioning about the purpose of life itself. Then came occupation, and Etty was forced on a journey where it became increasingly clear that it would end with her premature death. Instead of going into hiding, she volunteered to work at the Vesterborg transit camp to help those who had already fallen victim to Nazi suppression to better cope. She discovered a deepening faith in God and resolved to stand by her community no matter what, and she began to write. She wrote letters to her friends, her lover, and people she met in the hard times of 41, 42, and this year, 43. She began to keep a diary documenting her thoughts as she knowingly approached her probable end. When she was finally arrested, together with her family in June, and when she was deported to Auschwitz and her death in November, she faced it the way she had already resolved a year earlier, when on July 3, 1942, a Friday, at 8.30 in the evening, she wrote, Living and dying, sorrow and joy, the blisters on my feet and the jasmine behind the house, the persecution, the unspeakable horrors, it is all as one in me and I accept it all as one might whole, and begin to grasp it better, if only for myself, without being able to explain to anyone else how it all hangs together. I wish I could live for a long time so that one day I may know how to explain it, and if I am not granted that wish, well then, somebody else will perhaps do it, carry on from where my life has been cut short. And that is why I must try to live a good and faithful life to my last breath so that those who come after me do not have to start all over again, need not face the same difficulties. Isn't that doing something for the future generations? Never forget.